Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, another edition of Southern Exposure, our monthly update of Tucson area news. Also tonight, we'll hear about a new book on the 1919 Chicago White Sox scandal, and we'll see how a local company is making an ancient building block. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The state's jobless rate went up one-tenth of a percent last month. It's now at 5.9 percent. That's higher than the national unemployment rate, which dropped to 5.3 percent. Arizona Department of Administration reports, though, that the state lost nearly 47,000 non-farm jobs in June, with most of those losses coming from seasonal education cuts. Increases were reported in professional and business services, along with the construction sector. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals today heard arguments regarding Arizona's ban on driver's licenses for young undocumented immigrants with deferred deportation. The state is appealing a recent Ninth Circuit decision to overturn that ban. The panel of judges today pointedly questioned Arizona's attorney with some of the questions asking if racism was behind the state's motive for the ban. And it's time again for Southern Exposure, our monthly look at issues from south of the Gila. Among those issues, the retirement of Pima County's longtime sheriff and a Democratic candidate announces a challenge to Republican Congresswoman Martha McSally. Here now is Jim Ninsel of the Tucson Weekly. Good to see you again. Thanks for coming up. It was a pleasure. You know, it's 20 degrees cooler in Tucson. Yeah, so. I'm sure it is. All right, let's get to the sheriff, uh, Sheriff Clarence Dupnik. 35 years. He's been down there since uh, 1980 when he was first appointed to the office and then successfully ran uh, to hold on to it and has held on to it ever since then. Uh, so a long time, more than a, a third of a century as uh, Arizona's top elected lawman. Compare him to, compare him to uh, Sheriff Sarpaio Babu et al. You know, he's very different from uh, the sheriffs we have uh, up here in Maricopa County and, and Sheriff Babu down in Pinal County. He is not a guy who tries to, uh, as he puts it, humiliate prisoners for political gain. He has never tried to try to, uh, you know, use that sort of campaign tactic in order to improve his own ratings. And I think he's very proud of the fact that he's treated his prisoners like human beings uh, in all cases. Uh, and of course, he became very famous uh, after the uh, sh mass shooting in Tucson in, in 2011, uh, when he got back to Tucson that day and, and really let loose about uh, his concerns about the tone of politics in America today. Will that be his legacy, do you think? I think that's probably what he's going to be best known for as, as uh, he's stepping down. That's what people are, are looking back at. Did the post-shooting comments, did that change him at all? Because he got quite a backlash on those comments. And he continued to stand by them, you know, through uh, the, the rest of his career. I, I don't know that it changed uh, him or, or how people perceived him. Uh, to some degree it did. But I, I think what it did was he, he probably would have stepped down sooner, but the backlash was so great he didn't want to look like he was going out uh, as, as sort of in, in some sort of tail between his legs sort of thing. So he stuck it out. He ran for another term. And now halfway through his term, he's, he stepped down. The, the, it will be his last day will be the end of this month. And then uh, his handpicked successor has already been appointed to finish out his term, and he's expected to run again. So we'll see whether this guy can uh, hold on to the office. Who is this guy? This guy his name is Chris Nanos. He's worked in the department for a long time. He's been the uh, chief deputy for uh, for several years now, and and, and Clarence has been uh, grooming him for this job. Real quickly, a major prostitution ring busted down there in Tucson with a bit of a twist here. We got some law enforcement involved, and I mean a lot of law enforcement involved. Several uh, Tucson Police Department officers, some Border Patrol agents, some other, uh, some firefighters, a, a very interesting crew were were frequenting this uh, establishment. There is there are several locations. Uh, the police spent uh, several years looking into whether or not there was prostitution going on in this uh, massage house. Uh, yeah, I think you or I could have looked at uh, the, the online site and figured out in about 15 minutes that there was prostitution going on there, but it took the Tucson Police Department a great deal longer. It wasn't until the neighbors were out there videotaping Johns coming and going, and, oh and some workers of the house came out and started uh, beating up on the neighbors that the police realized they, they had to do something about this, and so eventually the bust came down. The, the amusing thing is the, the, the police then released 
released a list of potential clients to uh, the press, but it went far beyond potential clients because they went through the cell phone of a property manager who's also involved with politics uh, who uh, was renting the house to them. And, and as a result, you had a number of, of city council people, uh, other elected officials, probably me, because I've talked to this guy, so I'm probably on the list. So I had city council people calling me up and saying, I hear I'm on this list. I, I've never even gone to get a massage, much <laughs> less something else. And, and they were very uh, concerned about their reputation. So is this, has this pretty much peaked here, or is it still, still more uh, revelations and uh explosions think, to come. I think most of the revelations are complete. We'll see where uh, prosecutions go at this point. Representative Martha McSally has a Democratic opponent now. Who is Victoria Steele? Victoria Steele is a state lawmaker from uh, central Tucson and the northwest side, has been in the legislature for three years now, and uh, is the first person to actually say that she's going to run. Well, we had another state lawmaker, Bruce Wheeler, say he was interested in running. He has since uh, backed out of the race. Uh, you, you've had uh, a few other former lawmakers, uh, Matt Hines has indicated an interest in, in running for this seat, as has uh, a pecan farmer and former Washington, D.C. attorney, uh, Nan Walden, whose name surfaces a lot when, uh, when that congressional seat comes open. What happened to Ron Barber? Why no rematch? Uh, Ron decided uh, at his age, which is uh, 69 years old, that it was time for him to actually spend some time with his family. He, he since since uh, leaving Washington, he has had some time to spend with his, uh, his wife, his kids, his grandkids. He's really enjoying that. He wants to be involved in the community in other ways, but he's not going to uh, return to Congress. As far as McSally's concerned now, it sounds like she's already raised at or near $1 million in the first quarter. As one of the few Republican women in the House, I'm guessing money will flow. Is that going to be A, an expensive race, and B, a tight one? This last race was extraordinarily expensive between Martha McSally and Ron Barber. I think $13 million was spent uh, when you add up all the outside campaigns and the candidates themselves. So uh, I expect it is going to be expensive again. Uh, this time out, Victoria Steele has her work cut out for her to try to match the kind of fundraising that Martha McSally is doing. Tight race, though? Uh, we'll see. I mean, it's a it's a it's a very uh, competitive district. It's about one third Democrat, one third Republican, one third Independent. But uh, it's really going to come down to whether or not uh, Victoria Steele can get his her name up, an ID up, and and uh, get the support she needs. Because a lot of this is is those television ads, right. Ted, as you well know. It's it's. Uh, uh, that that sort of barrage of television advertising that picks up your name ID. Hey, before you go, I hear that Tucson is looking at an actual uh, some sort of ballot measure regarding red light cameras, speed cameras. What's going on here? You have a uh, group of citizens down there who turned in uh, roughly 55,000 signatures on petitions. They needed about 12,000 valid signatures. We don't know how many are valid. The city's still figuring that out, but uh, it, it's probably going to make the ballot. It would ban the use of these red light camera and uh, and photo radar vans. Tucson has two photo radar vans, I think five or six or seven uh, intersections with the red light cameras. Uh, the folks behind who support them say they save lives, they, they slow drivers down at these intersections. The folks who oppose them say that it is an invasion of their liberty and it is a money-making scheme for the city. And we've heard all of those arguments up here before. How likely, though, that Tucson voters are going to say we want them out of here? You know, that is a really great question. I don't know the answer to that because I think uh, people tend to like something that calms traffic, but at the same time, these cameras seem to really get under people's skin. Yeah, they do. All right, uh, lots of stuff happening down south. Good to have you up here to tell us about it. We'll see you again next month. Always a pleasure, Ted.
100 years since the Chicago White Sox became involved in what has since been referred to as the Black Sox scandal. But a new book by the Society for American Baseball Research suggests that there's more to the story and that this is a cold case and not a closed case. Here now is Jacob Pomerinke. He is the web editor for the Society of American Baseball Research and editor of Scandal on the South Side, the 1919 Chicago White Sox. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on. I want to talk about Sabre, this, this Society of uh, the, this Baseball Research Group, because you're not only based in town, you're based in this building, so I don't know more about that. But uh, synopsis, what happened to the 1919 White Sox? Well, basically, the, uh, there were eight players for the Chicago White Sox who got bribed to throw the World Series to the Cincinnati Reds. And they lost the World Series in eight games. And then after the scandal got found out, they were banned for life from baseball. And this kind of uh, led to the commissioner with Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis, uh, the modern system of baseball's power structure. So we've heard eight men out. We've, that we've, that's, we've considered that pretty much the whole story. Are you saying that's not the whole story? Well, the book Eight Men Out was written in 1963, so that was more than 50 years ago, and we've learned a lot of new information since then. And we've got a lot of documents. We've got legal documents, trial transcripts uh, from their criminal trial in Chicago that no one had access to decades before. We also have uh, film footage from the World Series in 1919. You can go to YouTube and watch the, uh, some of the plays from the World Series. So there's a lot of new information out there that, that Elliot Asinoff, who wrote the book Eight Men Out uh, 50 years ago, didn't have. All right, so let's get to some of the ideas that I think most of us have regarding the Black Sox scandal and the White Sox team of 1919. These were undereducated folks. They weren't paid all that well, and they weren't happy with their owner for not paying them all that well. Thus, they get into gambling. That's actually one of the biggest misconceptions about the entire story. Um, we actually have new information about uh, player salaries and team payrolls that nobody had uh, until 2002. And it actually, th that information suggests that the White Sox were one of the highest paid teams in baseball. And so one of the things that, uh, you know, th this idea that they were underpaid and they were disgruntled and, and poorly treated by management, well, most players, most ball players were at that time. Uh, the White Sox were no different. So this is a, a story where, uh, again, this is uh, something where the, the myth has, has kind of grown up through history that these guys were underpaid, but that's not actually the reason they did it. What about the undereducated aspect and the idea that they were duped by these big city, big time gamblers? Well, the, the, uh, the thing to understand about this scandal is that gambling and baseball have kind of grown up together. As long as there's been professional baseball, there's been kind of a, a seedy underworld of, of gambling and betting on games and, and fixed games too going all the way back into the mid-19th century. And so this is a scandal that kind of grew up, these players grew up in this culture where gambling was kind of accepted, uh, very similar to the, the steroid era of the 1990s where uh, the, everyone kind of did it and a lot of people looked the other way. And this was how gambling was in the early 20th century. And so these guys grew up seeing games get fixed being involved with games getting fixed. And so they, you know, they didn't see anyone getting punished for it. And so I think they thought that it was kind of a, a low risk, high reward endeavor. Keeping that analogy intact, I guess the 1919 World Series incident to gambling changed obviously the way the game looked at gambling. The same way maybe Barry Bonds hitting 70 home runs and, and surpassing Hank Aaron and Babe Ruth uh, changed the way baseball thought about steroids. Absolutely. And, and you know, when the home run record started being broken in the 1990s by Mark McGuire and Barry Bonds, I think a lot of people said, you know, okay, this is taking it a little bit too far. We were okay with uh, more offense, but, you know, once the, the, the sacred records are being broken, this was similar to how the, when the World Series was fixed, that was a lot different than if a game in mid-May was fixed. Right. Okay, so let's get back to those days because uh, you mentioned that gambling was prevalent out there. It was, it was you know, it was a part of the game in, in many respects. How different was baseball in general? This was the dead ball. I mean, Babe Ruth kind of saved baseball a little bit, didn't he, by hitting all those home runs in the 20s? A little bit. I mean, this is, uh, the, the, the Black Sox scandal is kind of the, uh, the turning point between the old dead ball era and the modern game. And so you, you had this era where, where games were being fixed. It was a, a pitching dominant era, low scoring. Um, and, and this is kind of how they grew up. And then once the, the scandal happened, Babe Ruth kind of came into popularity with the New York Yankees. And the modern game kind of grew out of that. And, and organized baseball wanted to kind of get away from this earlier era with, with gambling and, and kind of a, a lot of the seedy underworld of it. We tend to glamorize things in the past, but how much, how big a deal was this incident? How much did it change baseball? 
Oh, it was the biggest story in the country. I mean, they, when the uh, criminal trial happened in Chicago, they were charged with throwing games and defrauding their teammates and the public. Uh, this was called the trial of the century. Uh, and, and, you know, they, it was a packed courtroom as they were going on trial uh, for, for conspiracy charges. So this was a very big deal. This was something where a lot of people thought this might destroy the integrity of the game. Um, this was, you know, again, if you, if you throw some games in the middle of the season, maybe nobody's paying attention, but if you throw the World Series, uh, this is a lot bigger deal. And you got all this new information, and it's coming from a variety. Say it ain't so, Joe. Joe Jack that was a kid never said that to Joe Jackson did he? no that that is uh, yet another one of the myths about this story but that's not a myth that Joe Jackson that was one heck of a ball player I mean he really was like the premier hitter of his time wasn't he he was one of the greatest hitters in baseball history and that's uh, part of what makes his tale so tragic is that he got caught up uh, in, in this scandal and, and he did take the bribe money but uh, but you know a lot of people do feel that he should be in the Hall of Fame uh, regardless of that oh, how do you feel about that well, I think, uh, you know, if you're only looking at the, the on-the-field exploits, I think certainly he uh, deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. Is there a correlation there with Pete Rose? Absolutely. And, and any time Pete Rose is back in the news, which is, you know, wait five minutes and, <laughs> and, and that might happen, uh, uh, Shoeless Joe tends to get brought up, too, because uh, those are the two band players that, that a lot of people feel like should be in the Hall of Fame. The book itself chronicles little biographies. of Is it every player on the team or most players on the team? Every player every on the team. Every single player. Because it's fascinating to read about these guys, where they come from, and it's such a different age. They come from farms, they come from this era and that era, and, and how their lives either kind of went well after that or they got into some completely different business. Uh, talk about the process of writing this book. Well, this is uh, part of Sabre's uh, biography project. We have it called the Baseball Biography Project. And the objective is to write a full life biography of every player who played in the major leagues. And Sabre publishes these uh, team-based books and uh, this is the newest one uh, of, of the books. And, and basically, yeah, we're looking at kind of their stories, not just on the baseball field, but their family life before and, and what they did in their careers after it. Too. And you mentioned SABRE, the acronym for the Society there of uh, American Baseball Research. You guys, first of all, what, what do you do? <laughs> we are a membership organization. We've got 6,000 members around the world, and they're the most pa passionate baseball fans you can think of. And we've got experts in every possible baseball-related subjects, from the early origins of the game in the 1700s all the way to modern sabermetric analysis today. So we, we, do a lot of, uh, we, we do a lot of publications. We also hold events, including one here in Phoenix called the Sabre Analytics Conference. And you know, throughout the year, we publish books and, and journals and articles. And you are based, you're headquartered here in Phoenix. You're headquartered in the building that we're broadcasting from. I mean, uh, why? <laughs> well, Phoenix is a uh, baseball capital of the world. Uh, there's year-round baseball here with spring training and the uh, major leagues and, of course, the, the fall league uh, in October and November. So uh, we wanted to be a part of that. We uh, moved our headquarters here in uh, 2011, and we moved into the Cronkite building uh, in the spring of 2015 here. So far, so good? Absolutely. We love it here. So did the, fu the night back to the White Sox, did the, fu the punishment fit the crime as far as these White Sox players, especially the ones who were banned completely from the did the, the punishment fit the crime? Well, there are different degrees of guilt here. There are players who were heavily involved in throwing the games and taking the money, and then there are other players who did not take any money, but they knew about the fix, they had guilty knowledge, and so they were all punished exactly the same. So uh, the punishment was a little bit harsh, uh, depending on who you're talking about, but you can't argue against the effectiveness of the penalty because what it did, Judge Landis was the first commissioner of baseball, and he came in and he just wiped them out and said anyone who was even involved in discussions about throwing games yep. is going to get kicked out of baseball. And so what it did was it put fear into everyone in baseball that you couldn't even be tangentially involved in a scandal like this or, or any type of operation like this. Interesting. Reaction so far? Quickly, what kind of reaction you get? Oh, absolutely. A lot of praise. I think a lot of people have read the book Eight Men Out and, and are surprised to learn that there's a lot more to it. <laughs> All right. Well, congratulations on the book and for being based here in Phoenix and for being a baseball. It must be nice to be a baseball fan and work in this particular business. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Deb. Tonight's look at Arizona sustainability focuses on two Arizona brothers who've hit pay dirt on a farm in Queen Creek. Producer Christina Estes and photographer Juan Magana take us to the Santan Adobe Company. We're in the middle of Sossman Farms. You could call these brothers mud farmers. This is our manufacturing facility. 
we produce Adobe bricks. Adobe is the world's oldest green building product. And uh, there's buildings still standing today that are over 10,000 years old. Their soil is the perfect blend. Not too much clay and, and a little bit of sand. But finding it was, well, kind of like finding a needle in a haystack. Lucky for Jason Manser and John Morris Jr., their father did the legwork. My dad started it in uh, Congress, Arizona. He was uh, working on a guest ranch in Wickenburg, and they were hauling all the blocks in from California, and he thought that was the craziest thing he'd ever seen. So he decided to make blocks and uh, found out that it was a lot harder than, than he thought. Uh, it wasn't just mud and water and make bricks. Uh, so he went to the, uh, the company that was supplying the block for Wickenburg Inn, uh, which is the Hans Sump Adobe Company in Madera, California, uh, who was the world's largest adobe manufacturer. And uh, uh, old man Hans Sump kind of took my dad under his wing and said, well, well, we'll get you started in Arizona. But first, John Morris Sr. had to trek across the state. He would get on airplanes with briefcases full of dirt, uh, <laughs> crazy thing, and take them to Hans Sump. And Hans Sump would say, no, wrong dirt, go find some more. It took eight years for Morris to fill a suitcase with the right dirt from Queen Creek. Well, my dad was pretty determined, and he, he was passionate about Adobe. That, you know, that's what he did. After Morris died, his sons took over Santan Adobe Company. Depending on the sizes, they produced three to 5,000 bricks a day. First thing, we, we scoop up the dirt, we stick it through the uh, screening plant and then we'll dump it into the other hopper over here and it goes into the pug mill. The pug mill mixes it with water, emulsion, and mixes it up like a big blender. It's like a dough, that's the consistency of the mud, and we'll bring that mud from the container and we'll put it in these Han Sump machines. Once it's, the mold is full, it lifts up, drives forward, sets back down, and we just do the same process over and over again. Every five to 10 seconds, we can make 24 blocks. Each one designed to be water and storm resistant. The same sun that dries the bricks also struggles through their density, which can make summer a little more bearable. At my house, I built a tack room. About 12 o'clock, when it's probably 100 degrees outside, you can walk in there and there's, you know, it's just a eight inch wall with the, the barn roof on it. And it's 10 to 15 degrees cooler inside than it is outside. 50 miles away, the bricks from Santan Adobe are the foundation for this custom home. The color and the feel of it really fit uh, better with, uh, with the vegetation and with the mountains and the, uh, and the terrain. Even though it seems static, it's a very flowing uh, material. Uh, traditionally, adobe is very straight, uh, boxy, uh, rectilinear type of homes. Uh, our style of architecture has a lot more uh, curvilinear nature to it. And the adobe works, works very well in that type of fluid, uh, organic flowing forms. The bricks are used in new construction and old. Santan Adobe helped restore the former quarters for military officers at the Presidio of San Francisco. And what they did is they took uh, three feet of the building all the way around the bottom of the building, cut it out and replaced it with our block. And we had to match the block that was there from 200 years ago. Mansur says their Adobe is also used by today's military. So we work with several different uh, defense contractors uh, simulating Afghanist structures in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, uh, the latest one we've done is, is uh, for RPGs, rocket-propelled grenades, and uh, they want to breach a hole in, in the wall but not level the building, so, so they use our block for testing. With so much business and only so much soil, we wondered if Santan Adobe would run out. Mansur says his dad discovered enough to keep him and his brother busy. We stockpiled about 30 years worth here, so we've got that under control. I guess our kids are going to have to worry about where to get more dirt. <laughs> the brothers use three machines, all more than 50 years old, that once belonged to the expert in California who helped their father start the business in Arizona.
We want to hear from you. Submit your questions, comments, and concerns via email at ArizonaHorizon at ASU.edu. And Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's the Journalists' Roundtable. We'll discuss increasing concerns over the governor's plans for state trust land funds. And State Senator Kelly Ward announces that she is running against U.S. Senator John McCain. Those stories and more Friday on the Journalists' Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.